Hey everybody and welcome to the Bruce Wagner Show. Today I have a very special guest. His name is Matt Wilson and he is the co-founder of Under 30 CEO. Welcome Matt. Thanks for having me Bruce. So tell us what is Under 30 CEO about? Sure, uh, Under 30 CEO is a website for young entrepreneurs. Um, it is a place for news, uh, advice, interviews, um, events, anything that has to do with people of our generation that want to go out and start a business, we want to be the go-to place. Cool. So, um, and of course I'm not, well, I'm not really 29, even though my Facebook says I'm 29. I'm, <laughs> I just say I have 29 years of experience. Yeah, that's it. There so, you go. <laughs> so I don't know, what what is the under, under 30 generation called now? X, uh, Gen, y, Gen Y. Gen Y, okay. Yes. <laughs> it was one or of millennials. Those. Millennials, okay, cool. Like, like Windows Millennium, no. <laughs> But not a failure like Windows Millennium. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> That's yet to be seen. So it's for young entrepreneurs. Now this is really timely because um, in this country we have this economic crisis going on, and and uh, so many people are are looking are unemployed. They're looking for jobs. Um, we actually placed an ad for unpaid interns, and in the first, like in forty eight hours, we got ninety eight resumes. Wow. Yeah. I mean that tells you something about the current situation. of And it was very clearly, this is unpaid internships and everybody's just looking for work. But this is, uh, being an entrepreneur is a thing that a lot of people are not considering. If, you're, if you don't have a job, make your own job, right? Start your own business? That, that's exactly right. That's where we wanna be at the edge of that paradigm shift where people aren't, you know, we realize that people aren't just handed their high paying job when they're handed their diploma these days. Not anymore. And so exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, if, you, if you're at home and you can't find your own job, well, you can create, you know, you can create your own job. Um, and so that's, we're trying to give people the tools and resources to be able to go out and do that. Okay, so how, well, for, let me first back up a little bit and say, how long has under30ceo.com been around? So we've been around for three years. Three years, okay. And um, how, what inspired you to, uh, to start this, this whole organization around sure. it? Sure, so when I was co in college, I was president of the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization uh, at Bryant University. And okay. so I don't know how much you know about Bryant, but it's a small private business school, about 3,500 students. Mm -hmm. and it's really heavily focused on corporate finance and accounting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, literally, you, you see people walking around campus in, in suits, and uh, <laughs> today I don't, normally, I, I don't normally wear a suit, but you caught me in one today. Yeah. Um, but it just wasn't, I, I wanted, I got there and I said, well, wait a second, where are all the resources for entrepreneurs? This is a great business school, what if I wanna go out and my, do my own thing? And everybody said, oh, well, you know, you can't do that here. And so <laughs> we cool. said, well, actually you can. That's the whole point is you mm -hmm. can just go out and make things happen for yourself. So we got together about five students, um, grew the organization into 150 entrepreneurs. Uh, we had Ted Turner and Kenneth Cole come and speak on campus. We had the world's largest elevator pitch competition. And mm -hmm. we were just surrounded by this amazing environment of, of smart, young, innovative people. And then, of course, I graduated and move home, moved home to the suburbs, and I said, well, wait a second, where did it all, all go? Right. And I said, well, if I was able to do this on a campus-wide level, why can't we do this online on a global level? Right. So that's what we set out to do. And you have, um, you're on, you're, you're, uh, have a, an organization on meetup.com, which is a great yes. tool for organizing in-person meetings and meetups. And, of course, then you, you created this website of, and... That's the center, uh, I guess. Yes, we hub. want they, right. We want people to come and get their news, their advice, see interviews with with veteran entrepreneurs who have done it before, and then mm. the young people who are making millions of dollars out of their mm. dorm room. Right. And so we want people to come there for the content, and then also come to our events. Um, I know you just interviewed Sharon Lecter, and mm -hmm. so we just had Sharon come and speak at one of our events in the Empire State Building. And uh, I mean, she sold 27 million books. Yeah, for those so. who don't know who she is or offhand, Sharon is uh, co-author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, and I don't know, something like 17 books, like 15 books in the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, and then two more since then that she's just published this year, uh, along with, uh, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill, Hill yeah. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. So tell me, okay, now if, if I'm uh, a young person, I've, I just graduated, I've got, you know, a fantastic degree and no job, and I want to become an entrepreneur and start my own business, what's the best way to figure out what, what type of business should I get in that, that's going to actually be lucrative now? Sure. So 
we always try to tell people, okay, look, figure out something that you can do every single day, just like you're doing with it, you know, with your, mm -hmm. uh, w with your business, you mm -hmm. know, it's something that you absolutely love. I could just tell when yeah. I walked into the studio, I mean, it's a vibrant <laughs> place and you guys wake up every day and you say, yeah. this is what we want yeah. to do here. Um, yeah. but finding that, that passion is very difficult for a lot of students. Um, and that's what, you know, your, your time as a student is for mm -hmm. is to go in and figure out, get a broad range of experiences and figure out what you are passionate about. Mm -hmm. Meet lots of people from different backgrounds, go out and travel, um, have interesting discussions with people who are, are doing it and go and study what that is that they're, they're doing, how they're making money. Um, but most importantly, it should be something that you love. That's, yeah. that's, we really, really drive that point home. Yeah, I think um, my opinion is that it's not hard to find what you're passionate about. That's easy. Just just uh, take a vacation and do what you love. Or think, imagine if you won the lottery and you're independently wealthy suddenly, what would you be doing with your day all day? I mean, sure. after you got over the fun of it. You know, what would you really want to do every day for because you just love it? That's easy, but having the courage to actually figure out how to make a business out of it and then actually take the action and make a business the out of it. The execution, that's, that's right, the right, tough part. Right. So I just um, I just came from the New York Stock Exchange and saw Mark Cuban speak. Um, mm -hmm. He was a billionaire, that, he's a billionaire that owns the Dallas Mavericks and he said, it's not, you know, everybody has ideas. It's not the idea that's the hard part. Everybody thinks they're a genius because they have a good idea. Well, that's certainly not the case. Mm -hmm. It's the people who execute and right. that's what, uh, you know, we say go out and do what you're passionate about, but you're, you're absolutely right. It comes down to, is this a, a business model that's going to make you money and can you pull it off? Right. So you, you know, you can look at, um, I mean, it's obviously easier if you pick something that someone else has done before. If, you, if nobody's ever done it before, uh, it's not to say it's impossible, but it's uncharted territory and it's a real uh, kind of a crapshoot to determine whether it's going to be profitable. What I did, though, like in, in, when we started Only One TV, is I looked at other people, and I mean, from every spectrum, I look at Oprah Winfrey on one end, and I look at like Leo Laporte on Twit TV sure. on the other end, and I, I study and study and study. I watch the, every intricate detail about how they do it technically and, and all that. Not to say that I'm comparing myself to them, but, I, but these are people that are my mentors, whether they know it or not. Right. Who, who are some other people like Leo that you look at who are independent media people? Um, so many. Uh, well, Revision 3. Um, sure. You know, Kevin, Kevin Rose's Rose, company, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Uh, and there's so many. There's uh, was it New Next Now that now I think Google bought them, and there's there's a lot of them now. But uh, I mean, really, I, I looked a lot at Leo Laporte for how he did it technically, because obviously we don't have millions of dollars of uh, you know <laughs> we don't have Harpo Studios here and 200 people on staff to produce shows. Right. So it's like on a shoestring. Um, we literally, you can start out with, we started out with a webcam on a dining room table, but, um, you know, it gets a little bit more sophisticated, and, but and it's that's not the beauty of, That's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know, anybody can, I, I have friends who started their business with $50 mm -hmm. in a Twitter account yeah. and people say all the time, is that a business? Well, it is if they're making money. That's right. So that's what matters. Yeah. No, I like what you guys are doing. So I want to talk more about that. So speaking of making money, we're going to thank our sponsors. Uh, this episode of uh, The Bruce Wagner Show is brought to you by Mount Gox. And we are very grateful to have them as our sponsor. Uh, Mount Gox, if you, uh, I was just uh, giving you, Matt, a, an article from Forbes about Bitcoin, introducing you to that. Bitcoin, if you haven't heard of it, is, uh, is the money of the future, we call it. It's like the most exciting new technology since the invention of the internet itself. It's a completely distributed, decentralized electronic currency. It's like electronic cash, but it's not issued by any bank or government or organization or company or anything. So it's like the internet itself. Remember the dot-com boom where everybody wanted to buy some internet? That's going to be the next big thing. Well, this is kind of like the internet. It's not controlled by anybody. It's peer-to-peer uh, network created on open source software. It's a fascinating thing. So to learn more about Bitcoin, you can go to bitcoinme.com. It's B-I-T-C-O-I-N, by the way, me.com. But Mt. Gox, so Mt. Gox, where do they come in? They are, there are dozens now of online exchanges where you can buy Bitcoin for cash or sell Bitcoin for cash. Sure. Are they doing it on Facebook yet? They, well, not on Facebook, but they, there are, uh, like, there are pages, like, there's a page on Facebook called I Buy and Sell Bitcoin for Cash. So if you can just search, search uh, Facebook for Bitcoin and you can find them. 
But the, uh, you can do it with local people. You can find somebody in your neighborhood who wants to exchange. But from the comfort of your home, you can literally go online 24-7 and use an automated exchange site. And that's what Mt. Gox is. Mt. Gox is, uh, number one, they've got more than 90% market share. And they've been around the longest. Very, very trustworthy, reliable uh, site and company. So they, they charge a fee, but it's very, very minuscule little fee, like about like just less than 1%, 0.65 or something like that percent for the exchanges. But it matches up buyers and sellers all over the world, 24 hours a day, completely automated, and up to, in 16 currencies. So it doesn't matter if it's US wow. dollars or whatever, you know, Japanese yen, it doesn't matter what it is. So you can buy and sell Bitcoin for cash, and that's what Mt. Gox does. Now they also have, you can use it as a Bitcoin wallet, it's extremely secure. They have this thing, uh, two-factor authentication they call it, it's a little USB key, it's tiny, like a little dongle thing that you put on your keychain, literally, it's tiny. And you stick that into the USB port and you can't log in without it. So even if you're using a public computer that's full of viruses, it doesn't matter. No, nobody can get in without that USB key because it gives it a password that's only good for two seconds. Interesting. Really cool. So it's super, super secure online. And they also have apps for your Android phone too so that you can send and receive Bitcoin and barcode scanning, all kinds of stuff. It's called Mt. Gox Mobile. So uh, really check it out. Cool. It's mtgox.com. And we thank uh, Mt. Gox um, very much for sponsoring the show. And... The Thank You Economy, which is a new book by Gary Vaynerchuk. He is a uh, New York Times bestselling author. Uh, his new book, The Thank You Economy, which you can find out about at thankyouEconomyBook.com, is fascinating because it, actually you would be totally into it if you haven't heard, heard it. You've already read it. it. You've read, read it. You know it. about yeah. it. Okay. I was going to say, if you haven't, you really need to. But it's all about right up, right up what we're uh, sure. our, your creek, what we're talking about. And that is uh, social media. You can probably tell me more about it. But it's, uh, it's about using the latest technology, the internet, social media, social networking, and all that to uh, make your business, your uh, 21st century business, into uh, more like the old days where customers get a real personalized hand-holding experience instead of, and oh, that's what I was going to tell you when we had Sharon Lecter on the last episode, uh, one of the things that she talked about was the difference between a business that's set out to make money versus a business that's set out to create relationships, long-term relationships. Interesting. And, you know, to create relationships with customers. And that's the difference. You, you can't, you can make money just by selling anything and have it be garbage and have no customer service and no support. But to create relationships means you've got to sell quality and give them a personalized experience. I, I saw Gary give a keynote at Big Omaha and he actually went up there and said, look, I'm not sitting here trying to sell you my book. I'm sitting here trying to create a relationship with you for the next 60 years. <laughs> and <laughs> then he pretty go. much just walked off stage. There you go. That's, that's really all you have to say. That's really what it's about. So it's a fantastic book, and I've been a huge fan of Gary's anyway for you know way back before this. But uh, but I think this is his uh, you know his best work yet. So uh, yeah. So we thank Gary, and uh, you got to check it out if you don't if you haven't already read it. Go to thankyoeconomybook.com and check it out. Uh, it's just called the Thank You Economy by Gary Vaynerchuk. So, thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Gary. <laughs> All right. Where were we? What was I? <laughs> I completely lost track. We, we got into the thank you know, economy. Know, the and thank you economy. Uh, you Oh, I guess, well, I was going to say, which I already did, I guess, is that uh, Sharon was talking about the difference between uh, selling things, just selling things, and which there are a lot of businesses that, are, that have that model. We know who they are because, you know, those are the ones that you drop as soon as you have an opportunity to switch. But, um, and creating a relationship. There are so few businesses that actually do that, that go out of their way to, to cater to the customer to really have a good experience. And, you know, even like Gary, Gary's book, you know, explains, uh, in my experience, like you can get on Twitter and um, tweet something about some random product or company and you'll get a reply a lot of times because they have people monitoring their own brand. Um, but then most of the time they drop the ball. You know, they'll say, you know, what about this? Did you see our website or whatever? They'll try and sure. direct you somewhere. But then I'll say, well, this is the problem I'm having. And then they just drop the ball. <laughs> they just don't, don't go anywhere from there, you know. So it's about an actual relationship. I saw in your lobby you had uh, the, the Zappos book of Company Culture. Yes. which Tony they Zappos don't, is awesome too. Yeah, they don't, yeah. Uh, they don't drop the ball. That's right. That's right, exactly. That's a perfect example. And like, uh, you know, Tony is very active on Twitter and very approachable. And so is Gary, obviously. I mean, you can literally tweet him and you will get a reply from him. I mean, maybe not right away, but sooner or later you, you probably will. And, 
I mean, I actually had, was it last summer, like last June or July or something like that, uh, Tony actually sent me a tweet asking for my opinion about something, which is just like, wow, that blew me away. Like, That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, really cool. So it's not only for uh, addressing complaints or problems or whatever, uh, but they, the really, really smart, shrewd CEOs actually use it to directly communicate and ask questions. No, that, that's exactly right. I mean, we, we surf everything that's said. If, if someone says something or links to under 30 CEO, I mean, we're on it. We know, if, mm -hmm. I know, we know exactly what's been said and yeah. we reach out all yeah. the time. I mean, that's literally how we grew our site from scratch is we had mm -hmm. no idea how to drive traffic or anything about search engine optimization or we just said, hey, let's help as many young entrepreneurs as possible and then if we do that successfully they'll tell all their friends right and it's it's worked so far now like 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 i was saying a lot of companies have that part i mean not everybody most most don't but a lot of them do where they're monitoring what's said about them sure and then they respond but um then the next level is like i was saying is actually responding and then keeping a dialogue going so the person says you know, I have a problem with this service, you know, and I, I can't get, uh, the product was never shipped or it was damaged or whatever, and I, and I can't get through to anybody, whatever. It's continuing the dialogue until the situation's resolved and keeping that, it's really an, uh, an eternal dialogue. It has to go on pretty much forever. And actually caring and not just yeah. being a drone behind a, a, a social media account. Yeah. I mean, I've literally met some of my best friends through the, uh, through the under 30 CEO Twitter stream. And yeah. then, you know, I say, hey, I'm going here to this event, would love to talk to you more. I mm -hmm. really like what you're doing. Maybe we'll profile you, et cetera. Yeah. And then you get, you build those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's what yeah. we're really trying to do with yeah. under 30 CEO is we want to own that young entrepreneur space so that mm -hmm. we know everybody that is building bi a business who mm -hmm. is from our generation. Great, yeah. And yeah, I think it takes, two, like you were saying, uh, really sincerely caring. And right. also, it has to be somebody who has the um, knowledge and the authority to actually go somewhere, make a decision, or, or give somebody some direct advice and, and not just bypass it. That's why outsourcing it to some third-party human robot, you know, I, I call them software. You know, when you, when, you do, when you call some kind of a support line and you get somebody in some other country and they, they don't even understand what they're selling much or what they're doing and they have no authority to do anything except direct you to the website and the direct website directs you back to the phone thing and it just doesn't go anywhere. There, I mean, I, I, there's a lot, a lot of companies like that. Well, and everybody wants to ha say, oh, I'll just hire some college kid to do my social media. Right. Well, you're putting this person as a forward-facing representative of yeah. your company, so just know that. You yeah. don't have to pay them any, any money, but you're walking mm -hmm. a fine line. Exactly. Yeah, I think that should be <laughs> one of the highest paid positions, really, because, yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, um, at least the skills, regardless of what they're paid, the, the skills and the knowledge and the authority that that person has, that, that has to be um, somebody who really is empowered to give the customer what they need on a case-by-case -case basis and, and they have to have the company philosophy just oozing from them. Yeah, I mean, they, they, yeah, they can't ever have a bad day and, you know, and chew out a customer or whatever it is because, yeah, that is the face of your company. For yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Rachel, who's the, the chief of digital for all of New York City, mm -hmm. I mean, she makes six figures and mm -hmm. she, is, she is literally paid to tweet for, I mean, she does a lot more than just be on Twitter, yeah. but that's a big organization and a big yeah. responsibility and she gets compensated for it. Yeah, and smart companies know that. Some of the biggest companies are, they'll advertise that you can you know, contact us through Twitter and whatever, and you can, you can actually tweet them and they'll reply, but then they drop the ball. They just, they just don't go anywhere. And I mean, I know that uh, if you're an enormous, you know, big box retailer or something like that, you, you, um, it's hard, it's really, really hard for them to, to take care of every single, transaction that way but they really they really need to try and they and sadly very very few do <laughs> they think they're they think they're too big to fail yeah exactly exactly but yeah, well maybe they are to a certain extent but uh, not really because wherever there is there's one large there's another like you usually usually you have more than one choice for anything you buy yeah well and that's what gary's book is all about is seeing this shakedown mm -hmm. if if the big companies aren't 
aren't seriously performing when it comes to taking care of their customers, yeah. little guys will pop up and steal away market yeah. share. Yeah, and if you're a productive person, and you have, whether you're an entrepreneur or, or whatever you do, um, time is valuable. Time is money. And, and you know, if you just say, well, I just want to buy a laptop and I want it to work and I want, I, I want to get this resolved, I don't have time to you know, monkey around with this thing. So I'll pay a little bit more to deal with a company that I know is going to follow through and, and fix this and make it right. You know, they'll they'll take a return or they'll exchange it or they'll set, whatever they'll, they they just make it right versus having to go and fight with a low level clerk that just says no 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 no. You, know? you, you sound like you're you're speaking from experience. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. I mean, who hasn't had that experience? You mm -hmm. know, um, you you save a, a dollar to you know with these mass retailers, but. It definitely costs you if you ever have any problem. You know, you may just have to eat the loss and buy another one or whatever it is. I agree. <laughs> okay, so um, we talked about if you're if you're a young person you, and you're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur and starting a business, um, how to figure out what to do is to find out what you're passionate about. What do you do when um, what you're passionate about? You can't imagine how you could possibly get paid to do it. Well, like me. Uh, you know, thinking it, in my example, you know, uh, I love to talk. So, you know, like, okay, how am I going to get paid to talk? It's it's hard. You have to be creative and and think of, and look for other people that are doing something similar. But like, say it's um, you know, I love to paint or I love to uh, you know some sort of an artistic thing. I'm a musician or a dancer or um, whatever. I like to do flower arrangements. How do you figure out? Um, I mean, of course, if you love to do flower arrangements, you could get a job at a florist. But how do you figure out how to, um, the most profitable business to get into yes. that will use your talent, and whether or not entrepreneurialism is for you, because it's not for everybody. Absolutely. So it's, it's not for everybody. The first thing I would say is go out and read Michael Gerber's E-Myth. Because he yes. says, hey, there's a huge difference between, you know, the artist or the and inventor the and, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. and then the person who's actually a, a business owner who can build that into a scalable entity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you're a dancer or you're an artist or whatever you are, I mean, just like you, you said, you love to talk, so you look at the people who are going out and doing it. And mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, I don't know your full background, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing that you've done something in this industry before. Um, Maybe you've worked no. on set. You've never, you've never done. Does, no, has anybody on your team? No. Wow, that's. I mean, well, I mean, people on our team have, but okay. I haven't. My background is all computers and IT. Okay. And I've, I've worked in, you know, uh, computers forever, and I worked in corporate and uh, IT, and then I started my own IT consulting firm, which means computer consulting for those sure. of you who don't know. And I've just been a geek in computers my whole life. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, you should, uh, <laughs> this is a really weird story, but somebody said, you should host a talk show, my little brother, actually, who has never told me I should anything. <laughs> and out of the blue, and I thought he was joking, I, mean, I, don't, I don't get it, you know? And uh, what's really weird, this little weird story is that like three other people in the same week that absolutely have no way of knowing each other, they do not know each other, told me the same thing in one week. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> and, and Twilight that's Zone. How it, that's how it happens. And yeah, then you went me. and I'm you like, studied everything that you get your hands yeah. on. And you said, well, what are the relevant business models yeah. that I can make work? And then you had to say, exactly. all right, where are we going to get the equipment? And you know, and I'm sure you started <laughs> literally shaking everyone's hand that, it, you know, going out yeah. and saying, hey, I, I really like what you're doing. You're in this industry. Let's sit down and have coffee and mm -hmm. figure out how this, this business model could well, possibly the, work and out. And for me, the way it happened is I said, I, I had no idea how to, what to do with that information. So I told my brother, I said, okay, I'll be sure and call Oprah first thing in the morning, you know, I'll see if she takes sure. my call. But actually then what happened is I was like, what am I going to do with this? I had no idea. And it took me a few months and I started, I started trying to reach out to people that knew about the television business and I asked and I Googled it, of course, I researched it because I'm into IT and how do, you, how do you get your own talk show? And the more I learned, I met a guy um, when we lived in Florida who ha was, like, owns the largest television production company in Canada and he taught me all about how to um, create a presentation and pitch an idea to networks. And the more I learned about it, the more I was absolutely positive I did not want to do that. I don't want to be in that business. If I have to pitch some idea to a room full of suits who are going to you know, make a life and death decision about, my, about me and my career, and then maybe just throw me out and take my idea and <laughs> have somebody else do it. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. You I, wanted to own I, it. I want to do it. Yeah, I don't want to you know, pitch it. I want to do it. 
just do it. And if it, if it survives, it survives. If not, it doesn't. But that's the way I, you know, it's, I have that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, I guess. That's good. That's, that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. Yeah. But I, how do you do that? And so, but then I finally woke up one day and went, wait a minute. There's a reason for all this. There's a reason my background is all technical in computers and IT. And I've been saying for years, all television will be delivered through the internet within five years. I've been saying that for years. And all of a sudden I would realize like, wait a minute, <laughs> TV is delivered through the internet. I could do this myself. Sure. And then who were, so your brother said, hey, yeah, uh, th that's a great idea. You have a great personality. You should definitely go on the air. But then who were the people, I bet you called your mom and she said, you know, maybe you should stick to computers. Or somebody <laughs> said, this business model is never going to work. It's going to take a ton of sponsorship. Here we are in Midtown Manhattan. You, you're going to pay rent on a, on a television studio. How are you going to pull that off? Who asked you the tough questions? Yeah, my parents have uh, both had their transition. They passed away, so they weren't there. And my brother didn't say I had a great personality. But other than that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I hadn't even considered, you know, I mean, this, this was actually like about a three-year period that it took because it took, like, for, uh, for about a year or two, I was... Th still thinking, probably at least a year, year and a half, I was still trying to figure out, strategize how to pitch this to a, a traditional network. It took a long time to figure out that to wake up and have that aha moment that, wait a minute, we could do this on the internet. Okay. And then when I started doing that, then I was researching um, the idea of doing it on the internet. And I think most of my friends by now that know me, uh, my closest friends and family, they know that I'm crazy enough to do anything. And um, I don't think anybody actually said... Uh, I don't think you're going to do it. I mean, I know most people, every, you know, they're fam especially family. Uh -huh. they're like, you know, how are you going to... Uh, I always take this as the biggest insult. I shouldn't, but I always say one of the biggest insults you can ever say to someone is these two words, be realistic. When your parents or your friends or your loved ones or whatever, your spouse even, you know, you have this dream and you want to, you know, whatever, I want to have a, a uh, you know, whatever an ice cream truck or something and whatever kind of business you want to do. I want to, I want to sell, uh, you know, silk plants sure, you door want to, to be door, an astronaut. whatever. Yeah. And they say, look, be realistic, you know, just get a job and all that. Um, it's really to cut you down. It's to say, I mean, they don't intend it that way, but, um, it really has that effect. It's, it's just saying, look, you're not good enough. Do what, you know, do what everybody right. else does. And, and it's really not about you. It's about themselves and their own fear. It, it's true. And so you're the one who's going out and doing it. Everybody else is just yeah. saying, oh, be realistic. Um, but what we always tell our entrepreneurs is we say, hey, look, you know, believe in yourself and, and all that and surround yourself with positive people, et cetera. But have those people in your life that you can go to who know business yeah. and can ask you the tough questions and can poke holes mm -hmm. in, in your business model and you know throw yourselves to the throw yourself in your business to the sharks once in a while and hand over that business plan and let someone go crazy on it and yeah. point out all the po potential flaws so that you can come up with answers to them and if you can answer all those tough questions then you've got yourself a good business. Exactly. I'd say, you know, like, if, if someone has the right to say, be realistic to me, only if they're in the exact same business and they're already super successful. Then I'll hear that, you know? <laughs> then I'll hear what, whatever they have to say about right. being realistic. But even, I mean, hardly anybody. Even if you're in the same business, you can be in a completely different twist, a different take on it. And, you know, old media, new media, completely different thing. So um, they, the rules don't even apply necessarily, you know, for... An old media talk show, for example, and a new media talk show, it's very different business, very different business model. Everything's changed. That, so. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. we've thought about it a whole lot with mm -hmm. Under 30 CEO and said, hey, look, we're not Forbes or Fortune or, you know, CNBC, mm -hmm. but we still want a ch piece of the pie. Sure. So speaking of that, speaking of business models, what is the business model of Under 30 CEO? So our business model is based on sponsorship. Um, so we have people that come to the site and see... Uh, not only just your traditional banner ads, but we want to have integrated campaigns. Mm -hmm. So someone wants to promote a, an email marketing uh, software. Mm -hmm. And so we want to say, hey, this is, we're going to give you something that's going to be easily found on a search engine. Sure, you're going to have banner ads, um, maybe, you know, 0.7% of people who come to the site will click them, maybe, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. But you're going to read, you know, maybe this, this email marketing company wants to 
write an article on our site that's clearly sponsored and, and is transparent that this is written by the email marketing company, but 10 tips to create a great email campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that kind of content um, is is the stuff that actually is going to sell just like we you know just like you did before for the thank you economy and then we got mm -hmm. a whole conversation about it right. it's good relevant content and sure. it's it, it's sponsorship you know it, it's sponsorship and so then we have in person events which like I mentioned um, we had one on the on uh, the 60th floor of the Empire State Building we're having mm -hmm. another one in December and so we bring in young entrepreneurs and we say hey let's get together and network and listen to speakers and have discussions with other like-minded people mm -hmm. um, we're planning a conference mm -hmm. etc um, and then eventually I mean we literally want to own this entrepreneurial ecosystem mm -hmm. we want to say hey we know everybody who's building businesses right now how about we help them get to the next level um, mm -hmm. and so we want to start investing in startups for sure why under 30 why the under 30 you know, Chris. if I had a dollar for every time <laughs> someone asked me that and what happens when I turn I think 30, I know the answer, but I want to ask you. It, honestly, um, we, honestly it's, it, it was just a catchy brand name at the <laughs> time. Um, it's, we, we sometimes joke and say it's like 17 Magazine, that everyone <laughs> is 17 who reads it. Who reads it. Everyone is. It, exactly. <laughs> um, so there, we actually have lots of follow, you know, we have lots of followers and readers who are well over 30. Um, <laughs> we even have have a guy who now goes on Twitter by over 60 CEO. He has a talk <laughs> show in Brazil that we've been on oh, and he liked us so much that he started branding himself like that. <laughs> um, so, it, but really it's all about the mindset. Yeah. And if you want to go out and do something that you really love and you're passionate about it and you are willing to make a lot of sacrifices in the beginning that we want that to be our uh, the place. Do you find that there is um, a, a clear genera generational difference? Because I'll say um, in my, from my experience, I've noticed and I point out this that um, it's become to me it's becoming more and more distinct that every decade and now it's like maybe every five years in age is a huge difference because when it comes to um, not only worldview, but um, t especially when it comes to technology, when you know people over sixty, you know some barely can work a mouse. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, people over seventy don't know what a mouse is. <laughs> you know, if you're um, under a certain age, you grew up with Twitter. I mean, everybody, you know, they, they grew up with Twitter. Twitter and Facebook are passe. You know, and right. they just really understand um, that these tools and how they could be used and they're just com their mind is completely born open to these new technologies and new ways of, of living whereas the older generations are really fixed in the way things are and the way things were and you know what I mean we, I think it's human nature actually that it's always been this way you have a brick and mortar store and oh absolutely that's how we look at things brick and mortar well and most of our under 30 CEOs I mean we've we published our top uh, 30 list and I mean a huge huge percent of percentage of them were tech startups because mm -hmm. people uh, you what know, percent? Uh, I don't know what the exact percent is but mm -hmm. I would be willing to guess and say 80 percent were tech wow. startups yeah. um, but it's because these these people are, are multi multi millionaires or billionaires in Mark Zuckerberg's case and mm -hmm. they, you know, but they were able to build businesses that could scale that rapidly. You know, so when you're 18, like Zuckerberg, and you have this amazing business idea and you execute over the next eight years, mm -hmm. well, then all of a sudden, you know, you find yourself at like 25 years old and you have a, a multi, multi million billion dollar business in, in his mm -hmm. case. It's, it, it's that scalability that's so attractive. Mm -hmm. um, in the tech world, and that's why so many young people are, are taking advantage of that. And when you say tech startup, are you referring to like anything that's online as a tech startup? So, like, if I started a, uh, you know, a PetToys.com, that would uh, that might be a real company. I don't know, but anyway, if I start something, anything that's online, is that do you consider that a tech startup? Yeah, I, th I, I think so. I mean, mm -hmm. I use the term mm -hmm. very vaguely. Mm -hmm. um, pets, Pets.com didn't turn out so right. well in the <laughs> '90s, but. The good news is this time around, everybody keeps asking, hey, is there a bubble? Well, there, there is a bubble for sure because many of these companies are going to fail, but at least they're all based on solid business models yeah. where 
other, uh, in other times in history, like the dot-com bubble, people said, hey, we can just come up with a flashy domain name and mm -hmm. it's gonna work. Right. Um, but these are, these are real businesses and people are starting them in their dorm rooms. Yeah, that's what I say about that the, uh, that's why I'm actually, it, speaking of, <laughs> of bubbles and the internet and people, at that time, people didn't understand the difference between the internet and just anything.com. So they're like, that internet, that's gonna be big. I think that internet's gonna be the next big thing. And everybody knew, it's obviously sure, gonna be the next big thing. Sure, and then they raise an IPO like, and then yeah, a like, bunch uh, of <laughs> people just lose all their money on it. I take your money.com, you know, let's invest. <laughs> anything.com and they invest. And so, you know, but yeah, I mean, obviously it has to be, now based on solid accounting principles. And that's the thing about Bitcoin I was gonna say is if you, if you haven't checked into Bitcoin, check it out. It's really cool because it's an actual electronic currency that's uh, as distributed and peer-to-peer -peer as the internet itself. So nobody controls it. There's no bank or government or corporation or anything. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And, uh, but it, it is something that if people believe in it, they can actually buy a piece of it because you can actually buy bitcoins with currency and uh, it's like an investment. People are actually buying it as an investment because actually like, um, you know, la as, this is kind of a sidebar topic, but uh, last year silver went up, no wait, gold went up 25%, silver went up 50% and bitcoin went up 4,900%. Wow. Just saying. So it's an interesting thing. Some people are buying it as an investment and it's almost like, you know, if you believe it really is the money of the future, you can buy into it and, uh, and really own a piece of it. So, so it's fascinating. It, where is it traded? Is there a current, I mean, where is it exchanged? Well, you can, I mean, if you have the app and I have the app on my phone or your laptop, or whatever, we can exchange it, you know, right here, anywhere. Um, but there are these online exchanges. There's dozens of them. The number one with the 90% market share, Mt. Gox, that's the one I was telling okay. you about. Yeah, so you can actually go online to mtgox.com. It's like we're doing another sponsorship, but that's okay. We love Mt. Gox. You just go to mtgox.com and create a free account and you can literally just uh, you know deposit dollars or yen or whatever currency you want, and you have two balances on your account, like dollars and Bitcoin, and you can buy it at the whatever the going rate is. It's just like a matching. It's almost like a dating service for matching up people who want to buy bitcoins for dollars and sell dollars. I mean, sell bitcoins for dollars. So right, like, just like yeah. any currency exchange market. Exactly, just like any any other, like, almost like a stock market, but it's not a stock. But like, for example, if you own a diner in Brooklyn and you accept Bitcoin, which uh, there are several restaurants in Manhattan that do, and Brooklyn, and uh, but you need to do your produce order for the week, so you need dollars, right? So you've got Bitcoin in, and you want to, you need it, you need dollars, so you need to sell the bitcoins for dollars right away and uh, say he wants to buy Bitcoins as an investment. So he's got dollars, he wants to buy Bitcoin. So it matches you up. Basically asks and bids and it's all automated. So the price is determined by the going price, whatever the last, um, you know, the highest bid matches the lowest ask and all that. So it's completely automated. It's really, really cool. What are the problems with Bitcoin? Like, I mean, I'm not entirely familiar with it, mm -hmm. but I mean, it sounds like something yeah. that if it takes hold and reaches that critical mass, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's somebody's literally creating a whole nother yeah. currency. What are, what are some of the things that people are saying about it? There's, I mean, so the benefits are that it's completely distributed, completely decentralized. Nobody can, uh, you know, control it. They, uh, which is really a good thing. Um, the, it's the transaction, there's zero transaction fees. The transactions are irreversible, just like cash. So like if I send you a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, there's only one way I'm getting it back. And that's if you send it back to me as a new transaction. So it literally is like cash. It's like giving you cash. I'm not gonna get it back unless you give it back. Um, uh, things like that. So there's, you know, cause with credit cards and PayPal and all that, six months later they can reverse the, you know, do a charge back and reverse it and things like that. It's also uh, not completely anonymous. It's pseudo anonymous, but uh, it's as anonymous as you want it to be. So um, it can be useful for, you know, uh, donating to political causes that are illegal in that country. It's a global currency. So it can be used sure. for anywhere, for anything. So people know the value globally, no matter where they're traveling to. It's electronic. So it's super, super easy and convenient. You can do it with your smartphone. Lots right, I know PayPal is restricted in a yeah. lot of other countries. Yeah, and that's the thing. You don't have to have, I mean, you can literally be, you know, 16 years old and you can set up an account. I mean, it's absolutely uh, not regulated or you don't have to be approved by anybody. There's no banks or governments involved. Um, you were asking about the drawbacks right now. Yeah, obviously the, it's completely <laughs> de deregulated. <laughs> yeah. People can, you know, buy drugs with it. What and arms? They could. What? What, what else? I don't. I don't know anybody who is, but it's possible to do anything with it. Sure. Um, just like cash. Just of course, most people use cash for that. Absolutely. But, uh, <laughs> 
Um, but anyway, as far as drawbacks right now, um, the biggest drawback has been how to store it safely because anybody can use it. Anybody can set up a bank. Anybody can set up a, a website and say, I'm a Bitcoin bank, deposit your Bitcoin with me and you're, you're trusting a stranger and there have been bank heists, there have been people, there have been shady people who, who steal your Bitcoin. So it's about okay. where you store it. And also there are even viruses on the loose for Windows and probably there will be for Mac if not yet. Um, but for sure I know that there are for Windows that will actually, you get a virus on your computer and it will steal your wallet file from your computer and things like that. So security is a big concern. That's why I promote Mt. Gox because you can actually store it on there with the YubiKey and it's very, very safe because uh, it's on their machine, um, if you're, as long as you trust Mt. Gox, you're still trusting them. But um, security has been a big, big concern. There are new versions of the application that actually encrypt the thing and then store the uh, an encrypted backup uh, in the cloud that nobody can access without your password, things like that. So the, the second generation of all the software is just now coming out, so that's probably the biggest thing. Also, um, the volatility of the value of it. It goes up and down. And there's been speculation in it, so it's gone like way up and down. Sure. I, only, I don't even look at those big spikes. I only look at the, the bottom. So it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And I only look at, I connect the dots with the lows. So like a year ago it was six cents, and today it's something like $3. So um, I ignore those huge spikes. It actually went up to $30 at one point. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's, it's very volatile, so it's not great for... Um, it's not great to for short-term investment. Like you know, buy uh, now and then uh, sell it a month later. It's not not necessarily great for that. For long-term investment, it seems to be very good. But uh, so far, you know, the past. It's crazy. It's like the new form of. I mean, imagine the new form of, of obviously it's like a new form of currency. But imagine insider trading when insider trading when you're speculating on Bitcoin. Mm. It's totally deregulated. I mean, just imagine you find not, out, hey, that some, you know, Walmart is going to start accepting Bitcoin <laughs> and you fi find out uh, a month beforehand mm -hmm. and you buy up a bunch of Bitcoin and, and flip it. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really amazing that it's, Anything's it's deregulated possible. like that. And also, there's no, um, yeah, I mean, it's so new, it, it's not even considered, a, it's, I mean, we use it as a currency. You can use it as a currency. We refer to it as a currency, but legally, it's not a currency because legal, legal term, terminology-wise, it's not issued by any government or bank, so it's not a legal currency. So, um, yeah, so there's that. Um, the other thing is that you don't have to worry about people hoarding it either. Like with gold or silver, uh, like especially in the olden days, if, if the, the, the village, you know, somebody hoarded all the silver coins, there wouldn't be any coins for, the, for anybody to do any commerce. But this is not an issue now with Bitcoin because um, there's, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. It's a, it's a finite supply by definition. Okay. So I forgot to mention that's a huge benefit. It's huge because that implies that as long as people continue to use it, the value will probably keep going up. As, demand, as more and more people need it, the value will go up. Now, but it's divisible, virtually infinitely divisible. So you can have, uh, like right now, it's up to eight decimal places, 0 0.000001 Bitcoin. So in the future, if the value keeps going up and up and up, we might be buying a Starbucks coffee for five millionths of a Bitcoin. We'll call it MBCs wow. or something like that. I really hope there are some <laughs> smart economists behind this thing. Yeah, there are a lot, of, my head. a lot of economists and computer geeks and cryptography experts because it's a combination of the technologies or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and the state-of-the-art in cryptography and then the ancient idea of a limited quantity of something that we all agree has value. So those things go together. See, now we're off on a Bitcoin talk. We can't stop talking about it. We have a show, one of our shows, our flagship show really probably is uh, between this one and the Bitcoin show. So that's another show on Only One TV called The Bitcoin Show. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out, but uh, I, you get me started on that topic and I'll never stop. So, and you can, as a business, back to this, as an entrepreneur, yes. you can accept Bitcoin. If you, okay. have a, if you have a website, it's literally like two clicks. You go to, I created a little informational brochure that doesn't sell anything. It just tells about Bitcoin. It's kind of like a Bitcoin for dummies site. It's called bitcoinme.com. So you can check that out and click on accept. There's an accept tab and it'll teach you how to at your brick and mortar restaurant or sh shop or whatever, or on a website, you literally just a couple clicks, you get a Bitcoin address. It's like your own email address and you can put it on your website and you can say, we accept Bitcoin and that's it. It's super, super simple. And then you can get ro really compli complicated. If you want to have uh, an online shopping cart system, they have those developed already and stuff. It's really, really uh, sophisticated now. And you don't, it's like literally in five minutes, you can be set up to accept Bitcoin as well as your credit cards and PayPal and all that stuff.
It's crazy that someone can, in, in today's day and age, you can just invent a new currency. I know, right? <laughs> well, it was uh, invented in t- t- uh, 2009, and people just started finding out about it. Well, I learned about it in November 2010. But, uh, but yeah, people are still learning about it. Actually, the, the December Wired magazine is going to have a big, big, uh, their is- I don't know if the whole issue is de- dedicated to it, but I think it's a cover story about Bitcoin that's going to be real interesting coming out. Cool, I'll have to check it out. So check that out. So, all right, so back to this, entrepreneurialism. So let's say I am uh, a, a young, te- by the way, back to the age thing. If you're under 29 or 30, whatever, mm-hmm. um, you're pretty tech savvy. Would you, have you found that, that most people under 30 are tech savvy? Or is that, yeah. is that a... <laughs> so I see all levels of tech mm-hmm. savviness. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there, there's the people, I mean, I've met people as smart, uh, smart enough to be able to develop something like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And then college students who say, yeah, I know how to use Facebook and Twitter. That makes me a social media expert. Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a broad range, but all in all, our, our generation is pretty good because we've grown up with that. That's definitely true. But not only that, it's that um, we all have friends who are, are working in the space or um, we have the, just the intuitive nature to go and, and Google something and learn mm-hmm. more about it. You know, if, if back in the day, if you didn't know about something, you went to the library. But yeah. now, I mean, I think our generation has just become a sponge for information because it's all at our fingertips. I mean, mm-hmm. right on your phone. True, true. I know. I think that, I mean, there are always exceptions. I'm always shocked when I meet somebody who's um, 22 years old and says, I don't like computers. I don't like social networking. I don't, I don't, I don't even do email. And the only thing they'll do is text messaging and pretty much that's it. They don't even make phone calls, just text messaging, right? That's it. They, sure. I mean, when I hear, I, and, and I know a few people like that, that are 22 and just absolutely don't like computers or social networking at all. And I always find that as like a shocking exception. And then the opposite is true too, when there's somebody who's 60 years old and is real tech savvy, it's like, wow, that's also equally shocking. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, like my friends who are 60 in that age range, I would say when they want some information, they'll think of who would know that and they'll get on the phone and call them. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> but if you're, if you're, you know, my friends who are 22 or whatever, 25, um, they, their first instinct is always to Google it and research and read it and tweet about it or something, or Facebook it. Yeah, figure <laughs> out, fi- you know, who, that's, see, that's our version of picking up the phone and calling somebody yeah. who knows, well, tap into your 800 Facebook friends and yeah. see which one of them knows. Yeah, or you tweet about it and you get a response from uh, Cairo and Uzbekistan. You know, exactly. It's Philippines, everywhere. So you, have, you tap right into the global consciousness of uh, humankind. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So the, the young people have grown up with this and they just, uh, it's just like second nature to them. It's just like their left hand, the, the internet being right there. So if you say about maybe, you're guessing about 80% of the, the new entrepreneurial businesses are startup, tech startups? I, I would say the ones that are on our top list. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing you know, young entrepreneurs getting into real estate and getting into their, their family business that they've studied forever or getting into you know, other things that they're passionate about that don't have anything to do with technology. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of those businesses are, are somehow looped back into the, the tech industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I mean, it, it, it can be anything as, as long as there is opportunity there. Okay, so like if um, I'm going to use myself as an example again because I remember when I was told that I should host a talk show. <laughs> And I didn't know anything about it other than watching talk shows. And I knew a lot of most, I didn't want to do that, most of them. Uh, but I, I, I don't know anything about the business, really. And so your first instinct, if you're you know, savvy enough, is to Google it, Google it, research it, talk to everybody you know in your social circles. Does anybody know about this business? And pick sure. everybody's brain, and yep. both, both publicly on Twitter, Facebook, and among, among your friends. But let's say it's something kind of unique, like starting an internet television network. There's not that many. And so um, basically nobody knew. I mean, even Google didn't know. I mean, that was really weird because, I mean, you'd find all these articles about, you know, again, old media, you know, all kinds of things that really didn't relate to me. So um, what I found was that uh, I really felt like I needed a mentor. 
I needed somebody who was successful in this to be my mentor. Okay. And uh, I, in my case, I, I, I found my mentors, but um, without actually having any relationship, one-way relationship with them. <laughs> like they're my mentors, but they don't even know it. So, right. <laughs> so I just picked them and I studied them, and you know, I didn't become a stalker, but you know, I, I just absorbed everything I could from studying their life, their career, and stuff like that. But it would have been better to have an actual mentor relationship. Do you promote uh, the idea of finding a mentor? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so. Yeah, you could go and look at someone like Kevin Rose, who has you know a million plus followers for and has a tremendous web show, et cetera, um, and a whole network. So mm -hmm. you know, but you could probably call Kevin. He may or may not pick up the phone. Um, <laughs> but developing those those one or those two way relationships um, is really important. So we talk about peer mentorship all the time, and that's getting together in a, in a mastermind group or a shark tank and, and mm -hmm. saying, hey, look, ask me the tough questions. I mean, mm -hmm. don't hold back because I need to know how to dodge these punches. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very important. Um, the one-way mentors are great. And then we, we very much promote just, just emailing someone like Kevin Rose, and he may or may not get back to you, you don't know, but you'll never know until you try. Right. Um, we, just, we just interviewed uh, a guy named Samir from a company called Jungle Sense, and he just landed $1.5 million in investment from Mark Cuban, and he, you know, he has a mentor in Guy Kawasaki now, because simply because he just emailed them and said, "Hey, here's me my idea." He approached them the right way, and and now they go back and forth all the time. Um, and that's a real mentorship relationship with someone who, you know, people who have made lots and lots of money before and seen lots of ideas, and they can really poke some holes into your business. You you said that he approached them the right way. So expand yes, on that. How I, I do knew you were approach ask. them the right way? Okay. I mean, you can like for example, if you if you have a business that you're going to start, that's a, you know, okay, a flower shop, and there's a hundred million flower shops in town, or whatever. That's one side. And then if you're going to, uh, there's the other thing is that if you're going to, if you have a business idea that's brand new and unique, and it's it's really really unique, it's very hard to find a mentor uh, specific to that business, especially if it's completely unique. Maybe you're the first one to ever do it. But let's say you find somebody who you think is a brilliant business person um, and potentially even investor and all that. How do you approach them the right way? Yes, okay, so, and I like how you used an offline example with a flower shop because we feel that there, I really like to stress that there's really no difference in the manners between how you would talk, speak with someone offline and how you would speak with them online. So mm -hmm. don't walk into the flower shop during the busiest time right before closing and sit there and you know, read off a whole presentation this thick and, and <laughs> you know, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. You would go in there and say, hey, you know, I'd love a minute of your, your time. Um, I'm, a, I'm a young entrepreneur in the local area. Um, I'm studying different business models. Um, I'd love to ask you a couple questions. When can I take you out for coffee? Or when can I take you out for lunch? Or don't even go that far into getting into commitment you know, coffee is, is a commitment with a busy flower shop owner. Say, mm -hmm. hey, look, um, would you mind if I emailed you a quick, quick couple questions that you could answer on your leisure? Or if you're going to email this person, it doesn't matter how famous they are, email them and, and keep it brief and get to the point. Flattery goes a, 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 lo a long way. Don't, don't overdo it, but... Mm -hmm. You know, people people like to know that they're a respected person and that they're looking. You know, someone is looking for help from them because mm -hmm. they're going to bring try to throw something in there that's going to spark their uh, their mindset to when they were back. You know, living out of their car or selling their product out of their trunk, mm -hmm. etc. Because everyone says, "Sure, I'll do an under thirty CEO in interview with you," because. When I was your age, you know, I was doing X, Y, and Z, and everybody has a story. Yeah. Um, so getting these these mentors is really not that difficult if you approach them the right way. So keep it brief. Um, but, you know, be polite. Definitely, definitely compliment them, and but do your research mm -hmm. and don't ask don't ask ridiculous questions. Make yeah. sure you go and and give them quick little questions that they can answer to very quickly and grow that relationship. Don't bombard people um, because then, it, you know, if, if I open up my inbox and I see a huge email from somebody 
it's, it's overwhelming. But if it's two, three lines, hey, Matt, Love Under 30 CEO was just wondering how you grew it to this size. Um, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. This is in the position I'm in. I'm going to think back to three years ago and say, all right, cool. Let me send this guy a paragraph back. It'll mm-hmm. take me five minutes and maybe we'll grow that relationship. Yes, I like all those ideas. One of the I, one of the things I've learned about communicating, like through email, you're talking about the length of it. Is uh, I have this theory that the shorter the message, the higher the probability I'm going to get a reply. So, like a tweet, I always think tweet. Make it a tweet. If I get, if I ask, just if I could put it into one sentence or one question or two, even two sentences, the the chances of getting a reply are a thousand times higher than if I do. Three paragraphs. The, the brevity that te- that Twitter teaches mm-hmm. is really amazing. Yeah. You get to be very good at sending short, concise messages. Yeah, and I love what you said about you. You do the research. It's. I mean, the quickest way to blow anything like that is to not know who you're talking about, not know anything about them. At least Google them, read their Wikipedia page, know something about who they are, what they're about, and I mean, don't insult them by saying you know something stupid and asking them something that you know you should have known before you talk to them. And respecting their time, obviously, it's just basic consideration. If you were them, what you know, how would you want to be approached? Um, you know, not when you're out with your family or doing something social, not when you're really busy at business, but actually, literally, going maybe talking to their staff and saying, when is his downtime? When is he most relaxed? Somebody who works for him will know that, and they might tell you tell you that. The other thing is, I've I've actually heard this from super successful people, um, privately, you know, off the record, but saying. Um, everybody, at, like they would say, maybe, everybody asks me for either money or a job. So don't ever ask them for money or a job. Sure, or not up front. Right, you know, not up front. Don't email the person and say, hey, I'm looking for seed yeah. capital. Here's if the my relationship dad. grows, that'll come out of it, maybe, whatever. But um, don't ask them for money or a job. Ask, but what nobody ever asks me for is advice. So um, I love what you said about flattery, if, if it's sincere, of course. It has to be sincere flattery. And, and I think the word flattery actually denotes that you're, you're putting in too much fluff. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's a better use, I, a word to use. I can't put my finger on it. But Complimenting them, letting them know you're a fan, you know? Yeah, but being I love sincere. Your work. Being I appreciate sincere. your work. I love you. I appreciate your work. I've been a fan for whatever, whatever. And, exactly. and but it has to be sincere. It has to be true, or don't even bother. Right. But yeah, and then uh, and people can read that. Yeah. If you get enough of those emails, you know mm-hmm. who who's yeah. you know. And then asking them for sin- for it sincerely, asking them for advice, because uh, I think that they they respect that. They respect. They don't respect people who ask them for money and jobs, but they do respect people asking them for advice because they know there's no reason why you can't be as successful as I am. All you need to do is have, follow what I did, do my, you know, follow my advice. Sure, and, then and they know you're smart. And you're <laughs> opening yourself up. You're putting yourself at a vulnerable position in saying, "Hey, I don't know anything. I'm 20 something years old, and I don't know what's I don't know what's going on here. I just need a little bit of help. Can you lend me in the right direction?" Yes, exactly. Well, Matt, it has been great. We have to have you come back. Absolutely. I'd love to. And talk more about all this. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, absolutely. All right. Take care, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for joining us.